Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge what happened in Israel this morning, a terrorist attack in which four, four people were killed. Following this event at 2.33 in the Gluck Beit Midrash, there will be Mincha, followed by Tehillim, and Divrei Chizuk by the Rosh Yeshivas. We please ask that everyone come and attend. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce Max Stern, the president of the Sports Management Club. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming here today. A few years ago, four friends from Teaneck, New Jersey, decided to start a club that would give sports fans the opportunity to make sports more than just a hobby. Our goal was to bring in leaders of the sports industry who would speak about their experiences, specifically from a business perspective. With these events, the students would then have an opportunity to learn about different careers within this industry. Others could learn valuable life lessons as well. Today, we are very fortunate to have someone who served as the commissioner of the National Basketball Association for 30 years. During his tenure, Mr. Stern built the model for professional sports and league operations, public service, global marketing, and digital technology. Some of his accomplishments include overseeing the NBA's extraordinary growth with seven new franchises, a more than 30-fold increase in revenues, launch of the Women's National Basketball Association and the NBA Development League, as well as international online destinations and televised programming. At this point, we would like to present a short video highlighting some of Mr. Stern's other achievements. In the days before LeBron and Kobe, before Michael, before Magic and Larry, they used to say something about the National Basketball Association. They used to say it would never be as popular as other sports, that it would never truly captivate the country, forget about the world. They said the reason was simple. They said the NBA was too black. So then, how did the league get from there to here? To an age when it's not shunned, but celebrated for its makeup. When it's acclaimed for its diversity. When it's a symbol of how important a game can be across borders of all kinds. To the NBA and Commissioner David Stern, basketball has always been seen as an opportunity, a place where society could judge whether somebody has the skills to get the job done, irrespective of the color of their skin. Ray, rock the baby to sleep and slam dunk. Of course, the NBA has a proud heritage of activism dating back to the civil rights movement, headlined by a fearless original who set a new standard for both heroes and champions. A few young people here that would like to be president of the United States. You can do anything that you want to do, if you want to do it bad enough. But two decades after that, the league was dealing with a myriad of issues and still stuck with the NBA Finals tape delayed on television. Then, though, came the crest of a new golden age for the sport, driven by the rivalry of two icons whose appearances tempted people to focus on their clear differences but whose talents, competitiveness, and charisma compelled us all to focus on the more important truth that a love of the game made us all so similar. I love this game. I love this game. I love this game. The wave of superstars that followed continued to transcend misconceptions about race. And the NBA's commitment to support a variety of critical causes began with a passion that has continued and grown. Fittingly, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday has always fallen in the middle of the NBA season. Over the last three decades, it's become a veritable basketball holiday and a call to action to communities across the country to honor the date with service. But few causes and few moments were as visible as the NBA's unwavering support of one of its biggest stars in 1991. Because of the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. And that was only the start of how the league helped Magic change the perception and the conversation about HIV and AIDS. Three-pointer, yes, oh my! Meanwhile, thanks to an entire dream team of players, the push towards globalization was on. And after representatives of the NBA attended Nelson Mandela's presidential inauguration in 1994, they returned with a few friends in tow every year since, 
to give back to new generations. People ask us why we're here, and quite simply, we think that basketball is an incredible teaching tool for teamwork on the court and about life off the court. I love these By just six weeks ago, the league was back in Johannesburg as part of its annual Basketball Without Borders program. Today, efforts like those compose the many elements of NBA Cares, a model of the impact that a sport or business can make, both in local communities and across the world. On the court, too, the drive to impart change and increase opportunity took a landmark leap forward in 1996 with the creation of the WNBA. 17 years later, Generations of role models for young women are at the center of the league's success story. Meanwhile, on the coaching sidelines, in front offices, and owner's boxes, no league has as strong a record of hiring those who have been traditionally excluded as the NBA, with a commitment that has been unwavering from every vantage point. It's tempting when looking back on the NBA's history and growth, to focus on things like revenues, television ratings, and sneaker sales. But it's more important, more fitting, more authentic to spotlight another truth, that all the things they used to say about the NBA three decades ago are all but forgotten. Because the world has changed, and because the NBA has played an essential role in changing it. my honor and pleasure to introduce the Commissioner Emeritus of the National Basketball Association, Mr. David Stern. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. As you might guess, uh, there are more than one video that I have used over the years for introduction. And because I had a sense that I was going to be speaking about business here, and as Max said as an introductory remarks, um, I chose this one that had very little to do with business. As a reminder that there was a time, uh, which I'm sure many of us here who are older, uh, when uh, the, we worked very, uh, very intensely in the civil rights movement and the uh, two minority groups, African Americans and Jews, were co-partners in dealing with that. I had a cousin, a rabbi, who marched with Dr. King. It was always a great source of pride to our family. Uh, and as that uh, alliance has uh, frayed at certain points, I always thought that it was important for the NBA to demonstrate to the world that we had something to teach the world about um, about the subject of uh, merit, and that the NBA, you know, rather than being too black, was actually a place that could have a Bob Cousy and a Bill Russell, a Bill Bradley, uh, with a Willis Reed, and the main question, okay. Having a problem hearing me? Okay. We got it. We we can. We ought to. I'm surprised we haven't sold a sponsor for the mic. Uh, and and so it has been a source of great pride to me to focus on the NBA and, and sports as a place of opportunity, regardless of where you come from. Uh, uh, because you can, whether you live in nosebleed section or you're at courtside, uh, whether you're, you know, we're, we're, whether you went to Grambling or Princeton, if you've got game, you play. If you got an opinion, you voice it. It's a wonderful egalitarian place. Uh, so let's get to the business of sports. Uh, there have been several trends that people don't necessarily put together, and it's gonna, I'm going to explain to you why my success, such as it has been, has been a certain amount of luck, okay? Trend number one is the very game we have. 
which brings together, in many cases, 20,000 perfect strangers combined for the sole purpose of rooting the home team to victory. It's a very communal gathering. Uh, but the first important trend was the revitalization of all of our buildings. There's no, starting in 1987 when the palace at Auburn Hills was built, every single team now plays in an arena that was either built, rebuilt, or built or rebuilt twice, okay? And our arenas went from being gyms, practically, to these beautiful entertainment palaces. And that was a huge factor in the growth of our sport from an economic perspective. You go to a building, restaurants, suites, club seats, uh, cheerleaders, video boards, music systems. Occasionally a game would break out, but it became a complete entertainment experience. And we had a whole new kind of inventory to sell to our fans. So prices kept going up, capacity kept getting greater, and our gate receipts literally went through the roof. I think I'm getting an echo. Is there a way to make this a little bit less? Uh, okay. Um, and, and that had an enormous, enormous uh, impact on the business of the NBA. And by the way, still does, for those of you who work in teams or leagues, the bedrock thing that you need to do is to sell tickets, sell suites, sell them by season tickets, day of game, group sales, or the like. And in addition, sell sponsors who are very anxious to interact with the very, very people who you're filling up your building with. It's a, a quite a symbiotic relationship, but very important. Uh, number two, I guess, the, the second trend that I would note is that our players who used to be butts of jokes that they could never sell sponsorships because you wouldn't sponsor a player, particularly a black player. Then this guy, Michael Jordan, came along, okay? And together with Spike Lee as Mars Blackman, NBA players took off as icons. It was really quite incredible. Uh, we, were, we were enjoying it, you know, if you were an early watcher of either Seinfeld or uh, different shows, they always, always, uh, you know, had player, NBA players mentioned or dropped in. I remember George Costanza and Steinfeld were sitting in the back seat. Nick tickets, we're going to a Nick game, we're going to a Nick game. And in one place, this was years ago, uh, in, uh, what the show, uh, oh, I can't the name of the show, where someone comes to, uh, Murphy Brown, I guess it was, and says, you know, I want to impress my, my date, and you have tickets to the Bullets game, the Washington Wizards, to do it. And, and he says, well, yeah, I don't mind you impressing her, but you don't have to do it when the Celtics are in town. Why don't you wait until the Clippers come in? Uh, actually, the Clippers called me and asked me to stop using that clip at various speeches because they didn't like what it showed. But, but then our players began to be on the Tonight Show, David Letterman type shows, Arsenio Hall. I'm going with a handheld. Okay. Okay, I can handle it. And now my next job. The audio at Yeshiva. Uh, okay. I thought, I should say, at the 1 in 0 Yeshiva, uh, you know, they're in first place in the sky, you know, in, in, some, in, the, in, the, in some place, okay? Not in, it wasn't a conference opponent, but I understand. Um, so, uh, you know, so that was great for us, and we were really loving it, and that was a very important thing as well. Okay, number three, you know, and by the way, that's when sports marketing began. When I w was a young lad as commissioner, there was you know, no such thing as a course in a college, a course, a graduate course, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some earlier iteration of Max Stern was running around trying to have a sports club, but that was it. Since, you know, but, but in the intervening years, and there have been many, 
the sports agendas, sports curricula have really exploded and now there are just too many, but it's a, it's, and, and much of it focuses on sports marketing, okay? Same thing, sell those tickets, sell those sponsorships, uh, you know, and sell television time, of course. Uh, the other thing that happened to us as a business, and all of these are relevant because they're even more relevant today as we look towards the future, is television. Okay? In 1981-82, there were, we were tape delayed, and in I think 84, 83-84, we had four or five games on the CBS network schedule. In fact, when the NFL players were locked out one year, I went to CBS and said, I got a great idea. I've got a game for you on a Sunday afternoon. And they said, no, it's, we have something else, thank you. And I think it was an exhibition game between St. John's and the Yugoslavian national team. You know, so you have to have a strong ego, uh, and I did. Uh, but, and, and in 83, 84, people were saying, sports, you know, television, there isn't enough programming for more than two and a half networks, okay? And I guess I would say to you, that's a lesson for you to remember about received wisdom and conventional wisdom. It's often wrong, okay? Because from that point on, look what happened in the television industry in which sports now operates. We had Fox start a fifth network at the time, now it's the fourth major network, not possible. And then we had the development of cable, which was extraordinary, okay? So now the 500 network universe, and of course, we started with one ESPN, and in 1979, I negotiated the first deal for the NBA in cable when I was general counsel for the 79-80 season, and we got $400,000 from something called USA Network. And I was such a marketing genius at that time that I said, entertainment and sports programming network? Who is going to watch 24 hours of sports? We're not going to sign with this ESPN thing. We're going to sign with USA Network. Uh, and of course, there's ESPN 1, ESPN 2, ESPN U, ESPN Deportes, ESPN 3, e watch ESPN, don't watch ESPN, you name it. It's really, it's been incredible when you stop to think about it. Fox Sports 1, Fox Sports 2. NBC Sports Network, CBS Sports Network, Big Ten Network, NBA Network, NFL Network, Baseball Network, NHL Network. I mean, it, it, there has been a virtual rebirth of sports as it relates to television. And what we discovered as this grew was that sports was driving the growth of cable. When I made the first deal in 1979, USA Network had the most cable homes, four million, okay? Today it's 100 million in, in homes. And sports became a way to push that, and sports became a way to push regional sports networks, which is another way and another job at a, at a, at a sports team, which is, remember, tickets, sponsorships, television. That's what it is. And at the regional sports network level, it became important to sell local sponsors. In addition to getting the beer and the shoe company and the razor blades and the tires or whatever's current. Now it's all pharmaceuticals, but leaving that for another day in another philosophical discussion. Uh, I love watching pharmaceutical commercials. And the, the music running through the field and they say, remember, consult your doctor if your head falls off you're, you know, you may die of the following three things, suffer dizziness or have suicidal thoughts, but keep watching this commercial and buy this pharmaceutical anyway. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting category, that's all I could say, and I refuse to show my political bias here. Uh, so, so we've had this extraordinary run-up in all of the above. And then, wonder of wonders, came the digital world. Okay, so those of us who, so people say to me, well, did you have a plan? I say, yeah, I planned for the internet to be invented <laughs> and there to be digital distribution of television. Well, of course I didn't have a plan. Of course what you are 
And the way you'll ultimately judge, be judged is your reaction to circumstances that you couldn't possibly have imagined. You know, not just that you couldn't anticipate, that you couldn't have imagined. Because if you said to me in 1978, oh yeah, Stern, what do you think about digital? I would say, I don't understand what you're talking about. So along the way, the digital world came upon us. And we signed, in addition to having a cable contract and a regional cable contract for our teams, we signed a satellite contract uh, with uh, DirecTV was the first satellite delivered. And we did that. And then, you know, all of a sudden, cable went digital. So we had digital cable again we decided to have NBA League Pass. If you didn't get enough from watching Turner and ESPN and ABC or NBC or whatever, and your regional sports networks, we'll give you 1,200 more games to satisfy you because that's what the digital world delivered to us. So you now see sports as a, as a, a potential for delivering an unlimited number of events. And what you've seen in the most recent years and in the most recent months is this unquenchable appetite for sports programming. Why is that? Because it's live. Guys, but increasingly women, really, uh, guys are harder to get to through television. Women are easier because there's a, they, they have a broader array of interests than men do. So there are, there are different programmings that, that can appeal to them. Uh, but, but sports programming has resulted in this enormous gold rush of payments to leagues, whether it's the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball. We're seeing enormous amounts of dollars being spent on sports programming. It's live. You don't walk away from the set, and you really don't want to TV, TiVo it or DVR it, okay? Uh, and that's very important to sponsors. And even if you do tape a sporting event, you are more likely than with any other event to watch the commercials when you replay it. I'm not sure what says, that says about the guys who do the taping, whether we're just lazy, so we don't bother put, running through the commercials like we do with other things. And that is the, that is the circle of sports today with one exception, with, with actually two exceptions. Social media, where our fans, that community which the, which the league has developed in the arenas, that community that gathers to watch those events on television, that community can now gather by sitting and having Facebook posts, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, and there you go. Uh, and so the NBA has 700 million uh, likes, followers, you name it, on a global basis. And if I asked you what the city was that has the most Facebook fans, you would be wrong because that city is Manila. And if I asked you what country has the most Facebook posts, you would be wrong because that country is Turkey. So it all flows enormously uh, around the world, and that's terrific. Um, to, you know, and, and, and the NBA is very much on top of that, and, uh, you know, and the latest, before I get to the national, the latest issue is, but I think I'll wait for Q&A about, uh, about daily fantasy, so I'm going to hold on that for a minute. Uh, that suggested to us that there was a world out there, and the world out there is outside the United States, okay? I was in Paris with the Chicago Bulls in 1997, sitting with the Prime Minister of France. And the Bulls run on the court, and the fans stand up. They know what's coming. They're cheering. And uh, the game is being played. Michael Jordan, of course, leading the Bulls. And the Prime Minister says, may I go over to uh, the locker room after the game? I said, of course. Who would you like to see? Dennis Rodman. Now. I know you're laughing, but Ambassador Rodman, I think, is still the highest ranking American who's been in the presence of Kim Jong-un. So don't knock it. It tells you something about the power of sports. Okay? Uh, when I was with, had the pleasure of meeting Nelson Mandela in 1993, we took a group of players and coaches to South Africa. Uh, when President, soon to be President Mandela, was out of Robben Island and was not yet president. 
And in fact, we really, you know, were un we were hesitating to go because apartheid was still the official policy of South Africa at the time. And they said, don't worry, uh, Mr. Mandela will stop by for dinner. I said, okay, that works for me. Uh, that means we're, we're kosher, okay? So we went and about 45 minutes before dinner was scheduled, I uh, had a security calls up to the room and says, uh, Mr. Mandela would like to meet you because he never came on time because his life was in danger. And so I called the head of the union, Charlie Grantham, who was with us. I said, Charlie, put your pants on. Nelson Mandela is coming up to my room. And sure enough, knock, knock, door opens, Nelson Mandela. And I got the opportunity to spend 45 minutes with Mr. Mandela. Uh, and one of the things he said was, I think, fascinating to me and helped inform my judgment about what sports could be. And he said, thank you for coming. Uh, we kept our kids out of school as part of the protest against apartheid. And I, uh, your bringing books wouldn't have been so helpful. But your bringing sports is very helpful because I very believe, verily believe that in addition to keeping kids off the street and keeping, keeping them occupied, sports brings people together. If you, ha if you watched uh, Nelson Mandela, the movie of Invictus, you saw that Nelson Mandela was keenly aware of the ability when he walked out on that field in support of a mostly white South African rugby team that he lived by that. I was struck at the time, this is just a little anecdote, doesn't go to our own development. I said, why are you so peaceful? Why aren't you angrier? He said, well, if you come three years ago, I would have been in prison. And if you had come like two years ago, I wouldn't have been consulted by the governor, government for every decision, now I am. And if you come next year, I'm gonna be president. So I'm feeling pretty good. And I did go to his inauguration, and it was a really very life-changing for me. It had a big impact on my life. But we listened to that. And once in 1988, we were in the Soviet Union. With, it was still the Soviet Union with the Atlanta Hawks. And, and we were in Tbilisi, the capital of Soviet Georgia. The teams went onto the court, and the largest cheer was for Spud Webb. So I'm looking around saying, what is that about? Well. As you may recall or not, Spud Webb had won the slam dunk contest. I think it was five foot six in 1986 in Dallas. And it was shown on television in Turkey. And there were pirated Turkish tapes that were playing on Tbilisi television. So everyone knew who Spud Webb was. And so you begin to get a sense that this sport travels. We were in Kaunas, which is the birthplace of, uh, uh, in Lithuania of of uh, Savitas Ar Ar Arvidas Sabonis and uh, Sharunas Marshalonis. And you sit down at the city hall table and the mayor, the head of the Communist Party, the head of the Basketball Federation, you exchange gifts. And then they all, almost in unison, start to ask me whether I think it's fair, almost un-American, that the Portland Trailblazers have Sabonis on their draft list, but they don't have enough room under the NBA salary cap to sign him. And, you know, Something's going on here that I don't quite understand. And so that personal experience propelled us to the international business of basketball. Uh, the NBA has 13 offices outside the United States. Our games are seen in something in the, of the magnitude of 50, 215 uh, countries and territories. Uh, and our uh, social media experience uh, on a global basis is enormous. We have 150 people in China. Maybe it's more by now, they, it keeps expanding. Uh, and we've played, which people don't understand, 150, uh, more than 150 games outside the United States. Because we find that bringing a game to the time zone is a big deal. We've played for 10 years in China. We just celebrated the 10th anniversary of our first modern day games in 2004. And even that shows you how the world is changing. When we went to Shanghai in 2004, the arena was terrific. All we had to do was bring backboards, floor, lighting, sound system, video board, and build out the locker room. 
Ten years later, there's the Mercedes-Benz 22,000 seat brand new arena, and there's another one down the road that's 20,000 that the city of Shanghai built because they felt like it. So we have to have a practice for the teams on Saturday in the Shanghai building and then a game on Sunday, and then you move on to Beijing to play in the MasterCard arena, which when we went there in, 19, in 2004, was the, the, the whole of the people, and I got to sit in the club chair that Mao Zedong sat in during the Communist Party uh, annual meeting. So it was really quite a fascinating thing. Uh, and that brings us really, you know, sort of the, the present day. Uh, sports is a fully developed business, one that I encourage all of you to consider. But beyond that, one of the things we've learned is that sports has the ability to focus on very important issues. You know, when the Soviet Union wanted to open up economic, a dialogue with Israel, it invited Maccabi Tel Aviv to play in Moscow, and Israel, Maccabi won the game. That was the beginning of the second biggest Aliyah, okay? And that was the basis on which it was done. Uh, the worst side of sports is when Maccabi won the European Championships here, there were 20,000 of the most vile, anti-Semitic tweets you could possibly hear. And when my wife and I were in Paris, watching Maccabi in our final four of Europe some years ago, it's almost as though you haven't lived until the fans spread out the swastikas in the middle of a game without any concern about doing it. Uh, but it's the same thing that causes Spanish fans to run out with bananas, uh, you know, racial slurs against the African players, or the German fans dressing up in blackface to, uh, to, to, to taunt the team from Ghana and wearing Afro wigs. So sports has a way of, of, of not only being the best, but showing the worst. And that's the opportunity that I would talk about for two minutes, and that is whether it's domestic violence, bullying, anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, AIDS, you name it, sports has the way to engage the world in a single conversation. And that's something that sports should be held accountable for. It's not a bad thing, oh, shut up about all this violent stuff, let's get on with the game, wrong. Make noise about the violent stuff. Focus on the issues. Because it's, it's the unique attribute of sports to be able to focus on those issues on the one hand, and the other hand, talk about the spectacular exploits. Whether it's, you know, whether it's that one shot of Magic Johnson sinking the final three when he was HIV infected, and I had the opportunity to hug him to show people that you don't get HIV from sweat despite the fact that the Australian national team initially refused to play against the US Olympic team in 1992 because they didn't want to be exposed to magic. Uh, but, but there have been, but, but people ask me about what I remember and I never talk about the game even though I'm a big fan, I've been to every possible game you could think of. What I remember is the opportunities or maybe the problems we had whether it's run our test, deciding it was a good idea to run into the stands and beat the heck out of a fan, or whether Latrell Sprewell thought it was a good idea to strangle his coach, or whether Mahmoud Abdul Rauf thought it was a good idea to not stand for the national anthem, or whether Gilbert Arenas thought it was a good idea to bring his gun into the locker room, uh, or whether uh, Tim Donaghy thought it was a good idea as a referee to maybe bet a little bit on a game, uh, those are the things because, because we have to, and I had to, protect the sport, and I consider that to be a very important, my job, an important part of my job, in addition to promoting the game through every medium, through every possible uh, digital, uh, analog, uh, print, whatever. Uh, and I hope someday that many of you in this room will join me in that pursuit. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Even about officiating. Yo, in the front row, the guy with the yarmulke. Are you from Teaneck, New Jersey? 
Oh, good. Okay. I want to hear. I'd like to hear from someone who isn't from Teaneck. Right. Right, right. I'm very comfortable in dealing with things that aren't true. I don't know how else to describe that. Never happened, not true. Next. Sure, you, you, guy in the yarmulke. What do I think the effects of analytics are? I think that predictive analytics are going to change our game in an incredible way. All of us nerds, no, actually I was a history major, I can't even add. Uh, but basically we're going to see the combination of the information that is provided by raw statistics together with camera-laden uh, motion statistics. You know, we're telling you how the ball moved, how many seconds each player held it, together with wearable technology, which is how has every breath that the player has taken uh, had an impact. You know, if he says he's tired, is he really tired or is his oxygen high enough to say, no, you just stay out there? And finally, there's of course an Israeli company that is able, says it, to tell you what the emotion of someone is. So can you imagine the coach is going to turn to each of us? You're the emotion coach, you're the physical coach, you're the statistical coach, you're the video coach. What should I do? And increasingly, there is going to be pressure to follow the analytics. That this combination at that time is the, t is the one that the coach should have on the floor. I saw a demonstration uh, by a company that uh, you know, can take the video, have the player run down, and it will tell you as he passes each spot what's the t what percentage he will shoot if he does it at that particular spot. Here's a 60% shot for LeBron. This will be a 40% shot for LeBron. And so you're going to have coaches. It isn't about, oh, this guy's a 50% shooter. Yeah, but from the left, he's 60, and from the right, he's 40. Don't get him the ball on the right. Get him the ball on the left. And that is going to creep into uh, our game in a positive way because it, it's not just going to be plus or minus. You know, you probably saw the New York Times Magazine a couple of years ago. Shane Battier, when he's on the floor, good things happen defensively. Maybe yes, maybe no, but, but we're going to go way beyond that to a, comp a very intense reliance on predictive analytics. And woe is to the coach who says, I know what I know, you got to have the feel. You got to have the feel, but you better have someone on your team as well who's, who's making judgments based on predictive analytics. I'm looking for, is there, oh, is there a non-male in the room who would like to ask a question? No, okay, I give up. Uh, yeah, okay, who's the Sonics fan? All right, go back there, you. Poor souls. We feel it's very. Okay. I heard the part about how do I explain Sonic's Gate, but I'm not going to respond because not everyone here has seen it. But I'll, if you have a specific issue, and what about Clay Bennett? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't remember that at all. But, but honestly, uh, Clay Bennett bought the team. I actually went there, testified in the, uh, what's the, what's the capital? Well, Olympia, went to Olympia, met the governor, met the speaker of the house, Representative Chop, who you know, said, I got a great idea. Instead of us putting up money for the building, the, they should take it out of the player's pot, which of course the players thought was a great idea. Uh, and so they tried and tried and tried to get a building, and they didn't, and the other owners let them move. I appreciate the intensity of Sonics fans in their desire to have a team back, uh, and hopefully 
the commissioner may someday put another team back there. But thanks for being fans. <laughs> Up front. I was an associate and I was also a member of the firm of Proskauer, Rose, Getz, and Mendelssohn. During my time there, I worked for Adam Silver's father. That's correct. Ed Silver was not only the head of the labor department, he was the head of the firm. Actually, the, the question is, why did I recommend Adam to the other owners? What attributes? It's relatively simple. As Adam said, as he escaped me at the final goodbye dinner, he had been with me for 22 years in five different positions, all reporting to me. <laughs> So I knew everything he could do, and by the last few years, it was probably indistinguishable of what I did or what he did. So he was perfectly suited to take over, and obviously with all the things he's been doing, he's doing a great job, and I'm glad I was as forceful as I was. You two guys gonna stand up together like the guys from Seattle, or are you gonna do it separately? Go ahead, shout it out. Oh, I'm so, you know, you Lakers fans know that. I'm sorry. Right. Why was the why was the Chris Paul trade veto? Yeah, the second trade doesn't make sense. Well, things change. Actually, the the first trade uh, we we didn't veto it. Representing the t we decided not to make it. In other words, as the representative of the owners who own the team, I decided that that was not in the best interest of New Orleans. We with the trade. Why not? Louis Scola and uh, Lamar Odom and Kevin Martin, uh, we were, you know, uh, not, well, actually, actually we, really not, Minnesota, going, looking forward, Minnesota's first round pick figured to be a lot higher than 10, and we held out for that, okay, because they were a lousy team. So we, we had the basketball side pretty well covered, but, you know, but, but, but by the way, teams make decisions to make trades or not make trades. We had a runaway general manager who wasn't authorized to make the trade, and we told him he couldn't. There's a lady in the house. Oh, okay, Packers. Oh, how politically incorrect. <laughs> but it's better than the Sonic guys, okay? So it's okay. Two questions. Yeah, uh, I would say send your resume to the NBA, our executive vice president for team marketing and business operations, Amy Brooks, uh, played at Stanford, got her master's at Stanford, and worked her way up the ranks. I know you guys have heard from Scott O'Neill. He occupied that position before he went on to run a team. Chris Granger, who occupied it after Scott, went on to run the Sacramento Kings, and now Amy has that position, and she's being sought after by teams as well, but we're trying to hold on to her. Um, we have a very high percentage. We get uh, uh, women at the NBA central offices, and our teams are getting better. What would I do with Donald Sterling? I think Adam did exactly the right thing. I think he was masterful. He was presented with a set of facts that only led to one conclusion, and he moved to that conclusion and did what he had to do. And so I um, was very proud of the way he's doing it. There. What was the biggest mistake? There, were just, there have been too many to uh, say. One of the biggest, actually, and it's a personal peccadillo, on the Chris Paul situation, I said, the hell with it, I'm not gonna comment to the press, let's wait until we make the next trade, because that's our prerogative. Uh, that was a mistake, because my, actually my PR guy came in and said, David, they're killing you. I think you should change the trade, because the, the, you, know, you should go ahead and, and make the trade. 
And I said something trite like, that's why they pay me the big bucks. Let them kill me. When we make the next trade, we'll make the next trade. And that's what we did. And that was a mistake. I should have gotten out ahead of that story. But I don't, you know, I'm, there are lots of things I undoubtedly could have done better. But here we are. Sir. I, you know, I don't know. I think there's a, there's, we never had to deal quite with that. And there's a progressive kind of penalty philosophy that creeps up. We suspend somebody for two games, historically, if they pled to drinking while impaired. You know, I think it's going to turn out that that's much too little. I think that, I, that drinking while impaired is, you know, is up there and, and, and threatening the lives of, you know, possibly hundreds of people. Why should it be? So, so I think there's a step up in everything that's happening and the sports leagues are all going to recalibrate. I just don't know that, uh, you know, we've never had a case of, uh, you know, I guess child abuse. Although I now read in the morning clips that uh, Dwight Howard may or may not be being investigated for something like that. It's a, whole, it's, it's a whole new world, and I will tell you it's been changed by social media. Over here. Shout it out, come on, project. Right, right. Right. Okay. This gentleman is making the point that the postseason sucks because it's two months long and it, there are too many teams get into it and the regular season is five months long, etc. Do you know where the ratings are? You know what percentage of our gross rating points, like two thirds to 75% come from the postseason and 25% to a third? come from the preseason and you know why and and we're such geniuses that we used to have 12 teams in so what did you do then you take your best team and you give it a buy so it's not on television so it dawned on us we got this great idea if we go from 12 to 16 we could have the best play the worst and get very good ratings because they'll be playing so it's very much an economic decision and I say that I understand it's not sometimes it's not the best basketball and sometimes it is because you get a team like Memphis that suddenly comes from a position, or the Denver Nuggets of the Kembe Mutombo that knock off Seattle. So it's, it's interesting, and that's where it is. But I, I appreciate your point. Sir. Up. Oh, go ahead. Correct. The question is, do I think it's fair for the NBA to use its leverage to get publicly financed stadiums? Well, our, our arenas are actually less expensive to build than football stadium and, and have more events. So we have 360 day events um, and it's a reality, I, I, with fair or not. I think that we see circumstances such as happened in Sacramento. There's going to be a new arena in Sacramento. It both kept the team in Sacramento and it's going to be, it's going to be the centerpiece of a redevelopment of downtown Sacramento that was badly in need of redevelopment. I think there's a way to do it compassionately. Are you coming to pull me off? Despite all these fans out here with question after question, right in the middle behind the camera. What's my opinion of the coming of age attitude on gambling and professional sports? Can I give a long answer to that? Okay. I, it's, it's really, a, there's been a change in our country. In, as a young lawyer at Proskauer, 
I wrote for then Commissioner J. Walter Kennedy a scathing attack on legalizing gambling in Atlantic City. <laughs> okay? And by the way, at that time, maybe one state or two had lotteries. It was illegal up until the early 60s for me to have lotteries. <clears throat> and what we said in Walter's testimony, sitting with Rabbi Schwartz over here and Father O'Brien over here and the chiefs of police and the U.S. attorneys, if you have gambling, you will have increased alcoholism, prostitution, absenteeism, loan sharking, uh, and you name it, and it will not help anybody. And by the way, that was true, as you see now. It, it, we improved the site of the building. Subsequent mayors got taken off in chains because they were stealing money, and all those other things happened. But that has sort of morphed in a certain way, so that now every state has a lot. 44 states have lotteries, telling people to bet the welfare money to help education, which is ridiculous, with very bad odds. Watch, if you don't believe me, listen to John Oliver. And many teams, thank you, many teams, uh, you know, ma many Indian reservations have gambling and gaming in every city, etc. And now fantasy, which has been legalized, is really turning into daily fantasy. And if you can tell me why that isn't betting by some other name, you win the prize. And I expect some why you student to have the best algorithm for breaking the code for daily gaming because there's some graduate student at Northwestern in his, in his dorm who made a half a million dollars last year with his algorithm for daily gaming. So, so the attitude has so thoroughly changed that it might be time to reconsider. And, uh, and that's what Adam Silver's op-ed piece in the New York Times said. And basically, he was focusing on the fact that there's a $400 billion industry here that is, law, that is illegal, unregulated, and untaxed. Imagine if that were made into a legal, regulated, and taxed. It would be a real fountainhead of dollars for the states. And since states are looking, are, are trolling for dollars, they're gonna do it. I apologize, I'm, I'm being, I'm being told that two o'clock is like this, so thank you very much for having me. I would like to call upon Shopsy Schreier, the event sponsor, Joe Bendarsh, Talia Kugelman, and Leo Corman to present Mr. Stern with a gift. It says, I can't even say, presented to David Stern with gracious appreciation for all your efforts on behalf of athletic competition and the athletes. Yeshiva University, November 18, 2014. Thank you very much.